Good evening and welcome to worship here at Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Maria and I am so excited that you're here with us this evening. Hello to everyone who is worshiping with us online. We will be celebrating communion today and so um, if you are worshiping with us at home, please gather together your elements, your bread and wine, your grape juice, crackers, things like that for later on in the worship service. This weekend at Grace is Mental Health Weekend. It's the kickoff to some mental health events this month. Uh, specifically, members of our mental health team um, are writing devotions that will be published to the Grace website and to the Facebook page each Wednesday. So be on the lookout for those. Monday, February 8th, so this coming up Monday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. via Zoom, the mental health team is sponsoring tips for practicing self-care. And the last mental health event uh, around the holidays, they did self-care during the holidays. I personally went to that event and it was really, really helpful for me. And so um, if this sounds like something that might interest you, it's really, really great, and it's um, essential for us to pay attention to our needs and our own body and mind and spirit um, if we are to live as God fully intends. So the Zoom link can be found um, on Grace at a Glance, our weekly we e-newsletter. There we go. And there's no registration, so just, just come. Uh, and then the mental health team wanted us to share some save the dates. So remember this, this is coming in the future. A couple events on the horizon. On Sunday, April 25th and May 2nd, uh, they will be sponsoring two set sessions with Chris Shaw. Now, Chris Shaw is with the Heart and Mind Connection, and he will be leading discussions on Mental Health 101 and Suicide Prevention. More details for these events will be provided closer to the dates, but keep that in mind, April 25th and May 2nd. 
ongoing mental health initiatives at Grace for your information or in case you would like to be involved. Uh, the Grace Ribbon Parenting, or the Green Ribbon Parenting Group for parents and caregivers of students who struggle with mental health. It's open to anyone and they meet on the first Monday of every month. If you have questions, contact Christy Larson or go to the mental health resources page on our website. What's just happened uh, here at Grace is all of our catechism students went through a four-week program on understanding anxiety in our world, um, and that end is going to finish this Wednesday, and then a couple weeks after that, our high schoolers are invited um, to discuss faith in an anxious world as well. So for more information, if you're a high schooler, um, contact Christy Larson. And speaking of our middle school and high school youth, today we will celebrate Tom Baker's ministry here at Grace as he retires and leaves his position as youth coordinator to go and spend time with his family. Uh, Today and tomorrow, we will be, um, tomorrow, this is, this is the announcement. Tomorrow, between worships uh, at 9.30 in the sanctuary, families will be invited to come and to say their goodbyes to Tom. He'll be back tomorrow. Um, and we are very blessed um, that he is going to stick around and still be a member of Grace and still be here. We'll still get to see Tom and Becky and their children as they remain members here at Grace. So we're thankful for that. Uh, to the parents of young children, our nursery is going to be open again, and so um, there's a couple rules for that in there, um, and I'll be happy to share those with you if you've got any questions. Next week at 9.30, Sunday school will begin again in person, and then two weeks uh, from next Sunday at 9.30 in the sanctuary and on via Zoom, there's an all-congregation event to join the Grace for Rakai team and hearing directly from Richard uh, from Rakai, Uganda. He's going to update us on our sponsored children there and the challenges that they've experienced because of COVID, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions and maybe even see some of our sponsored children. Today I had the pleasure of going to Pastor Han's funeral in New London, where the family gifted me with this pectoral cross. Um, But maybe as you came into worship today, you saw the coffee mugs that were sitting on the ledge, and those were part of his collection, and the family has shared them with us here at Grace. Um, And so if you would like to take one of those with you, I invite you to do that. With that... We will begin our worship this evening in the name of the one moved to compassion for us, creator, redeemer, and life giver. Amen. Our opening reading this morning was written by a member of Grace's mental health team, Becca Hurt. It is our hope that her words will anchor our worship and our focus on mental health. These are her words. On display. It's complicated. It's chaotic. It's dark and begins pure. It houses our memories, dreams, and the thoughts that make us insecure. But what if these pictures were housed not inside, but right on my sleeve? Would I still be alive? I wonder what causes the world to forget that my mind isn't broken. I'm still working on it. Yet the world sees these anomalies and can't find what to say, except what are the treatments that can make you, not the heartache, go away. Not a matter of humanity, but of black and white. How many lives can we save if we choose to stay and fight? I become a statistic, a name in a book, and hopefully once a year, people actually look. My mind knows death and felt pain, but fears what might happen. It's not that I wanted it, but can't control the sadness. For some, the way I am drives them away, but for some, it's their calling. Their heart longs to say, they see me as whole, but not quite complete. Not a puzzle or a mystery to solve, but a person they can actually meet. Though my mind, it processes differently, it works on itself. Sometimes I've gotten this, and others, I'll try to ask for help. To see these minds as warriors who've fought and told the tale, 
can help us understand emotions on a more human scale. Stories of resistance and stories filled with hope, how strong people during rough times have learned how to cope. So I ask the world around me with one simple plea, would you still love me if my thoughts were written on my sleeves? Please join me in the prayer of the day. Healing Lord, by your goodness, you healed many who were ill, even raising the dead to life. Restore us to new life, healing our hearts, minds, and spirits, so that we may proclaim praise and gratitude for your compassion to all who will hear. In the name of the one who is himself new life, Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. I don't see, ooh, I'm really loud if I do that. I don't see any kids here tonight, but uh, we're filming, so I'm going to do a children's message to all those kids who are watching online. And maybe you all can join me and raise your hand at the questions that I ask and shout things out. Yeah? We can work together on that? Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, so today's Bible lesson is a great lesson to begin to think about how we as individuals and as a church and community can help each other. In the story, Jesus heals two different people. I'm wondering, have any of you ever been sick? Anyone been sick? Who took care of you? Mom, yeah. Husband, absolutely. You, of course, sometimes we know how to take care of ourselves too. Absolutely, absolutely. When you have a cold and you don't feel very good, there are usually people around you or maybe you yourself that knows how to take care of your sickness. But then there's sometimes when your body gets sick and you might not know what to do. Or maybe you get hurt and, and, and maybe you have a broken arm or you need stitches or something like that. You need to go and you need to see a professional, right? A doctor or a nurse, someone with more professional knowledge about what you're sick with. Last year at Kids Night Out, uh, we actually made activity packs for kids who were staying in the children's hospital. And maybe some of our kids who are watching at home helped with that project. In the same way that sometimes our bodies need special care, maybe we eat healthy foods and we exercise, our brains too and our minds need special care. We'll have good days and sometimes we'll have bad days. But sometimes... Just like how our bodies might get a little too sick and need professional help, sometimes our feelings of sadness or or anxiousness or worry get to be too much. Sometimes we're just crabby if we don't get enough sleep, but when those feelings are really strong and last for a really long time and they start to affect our relationships with our friends or maybe we're missing a lot of school, might be a sign that we need extra help, that we have a mental illness. And just like when we get too sick and we need to go see a doctor, these might be signs that we need to go see a doctor or a therapist or maybe get some medicine to make us healthy. Now, you might not be the one who is sick, but as we'll see in our Bible story today, we as a community surrounding others can support them We can talk to them and love them and help them find the help that they need. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Dear God, God, thank you for healthy bodies bodies. and healthy minds. minds. Help us take care of our mental health and to take care of others. And all the kids sang, amen. Very good. Good job, everyone. The first reading for today is recorded in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verses 105 through 107. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteousness ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. The gospel for today is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Please rise if you are able. After Jesus had finished all of his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly, who was ill and close to death. When he had heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him, earnestly saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but he was not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to, to come to you, but only to speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I am also a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they had found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went down to a town, town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gates of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her, a large crowd from the town. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bear, and the bear stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and then they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably upon his people. This word about him spread through Judea and the surrounding community. The Gospel of our Lord. I'm going to begin my sermon today with a little bit of a content warning. I will be talking a little bit about suicide, not in detail, but it is a part of my sermon. And it may be difficult for some to hear. So pay attention to your feelings and make the best decision for yourself, leaving the sanctuary or fast forwarding through the message if you need to. Let's begin with prayer. To the God whose next thing is never more important than stopping and seeing us with compassion. Be with us now. Stir in our hearts and minds that we might become a community of compassion. Amen. Today we have two healing stories. Maybe you've noticed that the gospel writer Luke likes to tell stories, stories that show the spectrum of possibility, stories that expand who and what we thought healing, grace, salvation, and community were for. Today we have two healing stories that will again show this spectrum of possibility and expand our understanding of healing. With healing stories, we expect to focus on the one who needs healing, the one who is ill, the one with the evil spirit, the one who is hurting. So it may come as a surprise to some of you, and maybe you didn't even notice reading through it just once, that our scripture text for today has little concern for the ill ones. We aren't even told what they're sick with. At least last week, we were told that the disciples were hungry and that the man whose hand was restored had a withered hand. 
Sometimes we get these details. Today, we don't. While reading the text in preparation for today, it dawned on me when I read the Bible and the Bible mentions someone who is ill, I assume the person has a physical affliction, some sort of bodily illness or hurt, something that we can see with our eyes. Even the stories about evil spirits or demon possession, it's often about the physical appearance of the person. I think maybe it's because it's something we can see or something we can picture in our minds. But because today is Mental Health Saturday at Grace, and I read the Bible through a different lens, and because the Bible doesn't say explicitly otherwise, I wondered, what if the centurion slave's illness was mental illness? What if the only son of a woman whose husband has already died didn't die of a physical disease or injury? What if he died by suicide? Why is it that I always assume the characters in the Bible are physically ill and receive physical healing? As a pastor, you'd think that I'd notice the spiritual salvific healing elements in those stories. But I confess, sometimes I'm just that dense. And I need the Holy Spirit to show me something new. Last year on Mental Health Sunday, Joanna reminded us of the difference between mental health and mental illness. And I think it's an important enough distinction to lift up again. We all have mental health. We have good days and we have bad days. We may even seek out therapy or adopt different practices to exercise our brains in the name of mental health, in the same ways that we might eat well or exercise for our physical bodies. On the other hand, mental illness gets in the way of our lives. Mental illness, like any other disease or physical illness, requires professional help and sometimes even medical interventions. My own experience with mental illness has been most often experience of suicide. While writing this sermon, I had some other platitude listed here about my experience being seen with compassion and reaching out to others, which is true, but I was skirting around the topic of suicide. While writing or procrastinating, I opened up Facebook and saw again a family friend who wrote about her father's untreated mental illness that led to the loss of his life. It takes at least two hands to count. In my life, the stories of treated and untreated mental illness that resulted in losing the battle with mental illness, not even counting the attempts. In my life, they've all been male. Beloved fathers, sons, uncles, brothers, friends, co-workers, and faithful men. And I know it isn't just men, but women too. It is an epidemic in our midst. And I can no longer ignore what is right in front of me. If you're struggling, you can come to me. Or please call the suicide hotline and get some help. I have resources. We collectively have resources to reach out, seek out, surround, and support those who are suffering, and so often suffering in silence. Built into our understanding of healing, both physical and mental, is the responsibility of a community. A community of healers, professional healers and amateur healers, doctors, nurses, therapists, pastors, friends, family members. Even as acquaintances or strangers, there are things we can do. And today we begin by talking about it. In our scripture text this morning, we are given examples, not of singular individuals asking for and receiving healing, or even individual faith that results in healing, but examples of how communities can seek out and surround those who are hurting, how a community's faith 
can bring about healing for an individual. I think of the centurion's own grief at the illness of his friend and beloved slave. A slight aside to note that it may feel strange in our understanding of slavery in the United States to recognize this relationship with the centurion and his slave. Although still slavery, it is not accurate to picture slavery in this same way. The centurion, although outside of a religious community, he was Roman, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, and because of his rank, his high rank in the Roman military, he was far outside the boundaries of Jewish religious life. But healing was happening in this man's life and in the life of his slave. Jewish leaders went to Jesus for the centurion to ask for the healing of his friend. True, He'd given them money to build their synagogue, but this was not outside of the norm of ancient time. And yet these Jewish religious leaders sought him out, surrounded him, and supported him in his grief, ultimately bringing about healing for both the centurion and his slave. The centurion used everything in his power to help heal his slave. His wealth, resources, relationships, privilege, and power. I'm sure the backwater preacher from Nazareth wasn't his first attempt at healing his slave. And yet, the centurion appeals to Jesus, recognizing Jesus' power. The centurion, as one who holds worldly power, understands Jesus' power, and Jesus commends him for his faith and heals the slave. But as we'll see in the next story about the widow, it isn't about her faith at all. She is not only widowed, but now has lost her only son, too. In ancient times, these circumstances left her completely alone and destitute, unable to provide for herself the basic necessities of life. She was vulnerable. It isn't her faith that instigates a healing, but rather Jesus' compassion for her in her grief. But before we get to Jesus' response and the healing that follows, notice how the woman is not actually alone. The text tells us as Jesus approached the gates of the town, he encountered a funeral procession. And with the man's widowed mother was a large crowd. This is miraculous for someone who is so utterly alone. A community that together bears her grief and walks with her through it. As Jesus encounters this, who knows what he had planned for the day? There was There was no question what he would do. He stops. Nothing in that moment. No appointment, no other healing, no teaching, no friend or travel schedule. No fear of what people might say about the interaction. Nothing keeps Jesus from her. Jesus stops and is moved to compassion. We aren't told she has faith, let alone great faith like the centurion. And not only is her son resurrected, but the woman is no longer vulnerable and alone. What I do struggle with most in these stories, though, is how in the end there is healing like we expect. But that's just it. Sometimes healing isn't what we expect. What really is a miraculous healing? Sure, miraculous healings look like being returned to good health or being raised from the dead, but healing doesn't always look like that. When I was in middle school, I sat behind a boy named Jordan. Jordan and I didn't know each other well. He sort of kept to himself, or so I thought. And there was a certain sadness to Jordan that I never really thought too much about until one day when he turned around in his seat and he put his arms up on my desk. And he said, Maria, can I ask you a question? Sure, I said. You go to church, right? You're, You're churchy? Yeah, I said. And then he asked, is it true my dad is in hell because he died by suicide? I was crushed. I could see his pain and his anger, and I didn't know what to do with it. I was moved to compassion. 
But as a middle schooler, what could I possibly do or say to make it any better? So I just told him, no, that I didn't believe that that was true. I told him that God loves him and his dad so much that God wouldn't leave him. God wouldn't leave either of them. God was with his dad and God was with Jordan. He paused for a moment and turned back around in his seat. Sometimes this is all we get. A window of opportunity to offer what we know is true about who God is. And sometimes we never get to know if there is healing. While on internship in 2019, though, Jordan messaged me on Facebook. Hey, Maria, he said, I know it's been a long time and I hope that you're well. I just wanted to thank you for being such a positive presence in school. I might not have appreciated it at the time, but your positivity and optimism has really spoken to me in life. I responded and I told him our conversations had shaped me into being a better pastor. And I congratulated him on his wife and new baby. And that's when he shared with me that he had become the head of the children's ministry at his church, that he found his calling with the kids. I don't share this to get accolades. In the grand scheme of things, what I had done was very small. His dad had still died, and yet I believe I was a part of healing that day, a miraculous healing. Lastly, although our scripture doesn't exactly bring us there, I would be mistaken if I just spoke about suffering and mental illness. True, suffering is a part of anxiety and depression and PTSD and addiction and schizophrenia and so many others. And we must recognize that suffering and its potential outcomes, especially if left untreated. Homelessness, abuse, broken relationships, death. But it is a gross misunderstanding and one-dimensional to view mental illness only in this way. If we commit to showing up in the suffering, can we not see the whole person and celebrate the successes of living with mental illness too? It is not simply that we swoop in when we're needed like superheroes with capes. That's not how this works either. But it's our calling to share our lives together, recognizing that we are part of one body, and when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And in that same way, when one part celebrates, we all celebrate together and live every moment in between. This is our call as a community of faith and our commitment at Grace Lutheran Church to stopping the stigma of mental illness, to see people in their wholeness, to embrace those with mental illness and to be in relationship that in community together, we all might become instruments of healing and wholeness. When given windows of opportunity, however big or small, we seek out, surround, and support each other. Like the centurion, we use our resources and privilege and power to advocate for others. When necessary, this can mean finding professional help or medical interventions. Like the Jewish leaders, we share what we know is true about who God is and God's love, even if we don't know what the other person believes, and even if they're outside of our traditions. And like the crowd, we walk with and help bear one another's grief and are there to celebrate, too. And like Jesus, we stop in our tracks when someone is hurting regardless of if we know who they are or what they're going through. We're moved to compassion. Amen.
Now is the time in worship where we normally collect our offering, but in this COVID time, we're not doing that. And so um, there are some baskets out in the back if you brought uh, your offering with you today. Um, Or you can give any time online uh, through our Grace website. We do give you thanks for all the ways in which you're supporting the ministries here at Grace and around the world. And we give thanks to God for all of God's abundant gifts. At this time, I would like to invite up Tom Baker because this is the time when we will thank him for his ministry and service here at Grace and celebrate his entering into retirement. Hi, Tom. I don't have my mask on. I don't know where it is. You're fine. Okay. Tom Baker. T. Bakes. Baker Square. True Tale Tom. Tommy Boy. Thomas Edison. And my personal term of endearment, T. If Tom is anything, he is a man of many names. I started at Grace five years ago fresh out of seminary with a head full of theory, theology, and biblical knowledge, although Tom can easily wipe the floor with me regarding biblical details. And I joined Tom, filled with years of experience and a heart for Jesus that I can only hope to aspire. Tom and I hit it off right away, which is remarkable, since we are the two most different people you will ever meet. (laughs) Details meet big picture. Careful planning, meet spontaneity. Feet on the ground, meet head in the clouds. Occasional ER tendency and periodic crabbiness, meet endless positivity and enthusiasm, who also can get crabby from time to time and more than a little stubborn. At first, it led to some interesting meetings and a lot of head shaking as we walked away but our differences balanced us out and created a team. We are not only great colleagues, but we now are good friends. I know that on a mission trip, he will return from the gas station with a diet Dr. Pepper for me, and he knows that I will return with a raspberry iced tea or Coke Zero for him. He knows that if I am starting to get cranky, he should gently suggest that maybe it is time for a snack. Once on a trip, he drove well over 100 miles to pick up a leader after her flight was canceled. And this is after spending the entire day at a water park at at a theme park and being absolutely exhausted. Another time, he dropped off his van of students at the front door of an ice cream shop and then parked several blocks away, walked back in in an absolute downpour. This is after driving past the close parking spot so that I could stay dry. 
When one of our youth found out Tom was out in the rain, one of our leaders says, don't you ever forget there is nothing that Tom Baker won't do for you. Our church, our youth, and our staff, and maybe most of all myself, are filled with mixed emotions today. Sad that Tom is retiring, although he's not going far, so you will still get to see him. And a little scared to pick up all the planning that he did. The last part's mostly me. But we are so thankful for the ministry that you have had here and that we have been fortunate enough to be blessed by it. Thank you for teaching me and for teaching all of us how to care. So we have um, a couple of gifts for Tom that do require a little bit of an explanation. We at Grace have um, had to say goodbye to several um, staff members here along the way and have sent them off with a gift of grace, something to remember us by in their homes. And then the second one, I'll let Tom open it and then I'll explain. <laughs> they are so here's the thing Tom has a habit of listening to not what I would consider great music. He likes smooth jazz. Jesus loves my jazz. So and and like so this is a gift for him and a gift for his family since Becca knows smooth jazz, right? Yeah. Uh, and a gift for his family so that he can wear the headphones and not everyone has to listen to it. And as we came up with this idea, I realized that I should have just gotten this like four years ago. And it would have solved, I think, like all of our office conflicts. <laughs> it's okay, though, because he puts up with like everything else from me. So it's, it's, it's a good balance. <laughs> so, um, so yes. Think. Bad we didn't give Tom a, a rebuttal microphone for the roast. <laughs> so, okay, I, don't, I don't need a microphone. I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for the 11 years that I've had here. Uh, when Becky and I moved to Minnesota in 92, we just had our son who was 18 months. We knew no one here. Uh, we didn't even have a shovel, you know, <laughs> or let alone a snowblower. Uh, but we came here so that we could uh, pursue our dreams, that God had wanted us to uh, be in ministry, and I have been blessed to be able to serve at two churches, uh, one in Elk River for 12 years, and then for the past 11 years. And I've had the opportunity to uh, work with so many great staff people, uh, pastors, volunteers, and, and some amazing students. And uh, who could ask for more than that? Uh, so now we're, I'm just going to take a break from things for a while and see what, what our next thing is going to be. Uh, I'd love to say that I'm moving to Florida on Monday. That would be great. <laughs> but actually we're just, we are, we are moving. I, I'm going to say I'm moving up north. But really, it's just Bethel. These are the jokes. Like, this is as good. Th th those are the jokes. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> uh, after five minutes away, so, uh, so we will still be around and still be involved in ministry here, uh, just in a different way. So, uh, thank you all, and thank you for your prayers and your support. We do have a blessing for Tom real quick. 
if I can find it. Nope, I got it. Thank you. Please join me. Tom Baker, we gather today blessed and honored to be a part of your 35-year ministry. As the youth coordinator, you have authentically welcomed, supported, and cared for countless youth as they walk through these doors. You have helped them serve and understand communities in our, in our, around our country and listen to st the stories of people. You've driven 15 passenger vans through snow, sneet, sleet, and mud. You have slept on air mattresses and gymnasiums and church basements, if you slept at all, that is. You have eaten countless bag lunches and through and through this hard work have earned dozens of free t-shirts. As you retire from your position as youth coordinator here at Grace, we wish to thank you for your ministry and service. A reading from John. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you came to Grace 11 years ago, we rejoiced and welcomed you in the mission that we share as both congregation and as the people and as people of God. You have come to know and share that share in God's loving purpose for you and for all creation. We give thanks for your vocational call given to you by God and as not only a youth leader, but as a dedicated, hardworking, loyal colleague and friend. God has blessed you in this community, and God has richly blessed us through you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the work and witness of your servant, Tom Baker, who has enriched this community and shared his gifts with his colleagues, friends, and family. Now bless and preserve him at this time of transition. Day by day, guide him and give him what is needed. Friends to cheer the way and a clear vision of that which you are now calling him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let's give thanks to Tom for his 11 years of ministry. Thank you. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, the world, and all creation, knowing God sees us and hears us. Holy God, we give thanks for this church and the ways we seek to live out Jesus' commandment to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. On this mental health weekend, we pray for people who live with untreated mental illness and who are unable to find help and cannot afford medical care. We pray for an end to the stigma of mental illness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, protect and defend those living with mental illness from exploitation, addictions, and abuse. Walk with the homeless and missing persons, those who are destitute and have no one to care. Forgive us for our indifference. Empower us to speak up for those who do not have a voice. Save us from making peace with the injustices in the social systems that have failed them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide those who do research for the prevention and treatment of mental illnesses. Uphold them with your compassion and diligence. For those who are in recovery and for treatments, that enable them to return to fulfilled and rewarding lives. We give you thanks. Grant patience and courage to the families and friends of those who are ill. Increase their perseverance as they face challenges to recover for their loved ones, or to recovery for their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, we give you thanks for the faithful ministry of Tom Baker. Encourage him in his life and faith as he makes this transition. Be with our youth programming, with Christy, our youth and families, as they navigate ministry without Tom in an official capacity. We celebrate all the ways you inspire us to do your will, especially through the faithful witness of life together. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, bring healing to those who are hurting, recovering, and living under disease, illness, and injury. Today we pray especially for Donald Bemis, Eric and Candace Mahawald, and their soon-to-be-born twins, John Maleka, Christopher Sluice, Julie Swedberg, Mike 
Burkhard, George Rongeri, Marge Davidson, Arden Kirkendall, Deb Corey, LaDonna Lilliquist, Linda Wilde, Deb Stang, BJ Scott, Charlotte Monte, Elsie Weisenberger, Linda Christensen, Carol Potter, Judy Wold, Colleen Wernemont, and we pray for all of those suffering for COVID throughout the world. We also pray that the end of COVID would be near. Hear also the names of those we now name silently or out loud before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of promise, grant comfort, peace, and the hope of Christ's resurrection to all who grieve. We pray today especially for Marcy, Maya, Kaylee, and Jaden Haggerty upon the death of their husband and father, Pat Haggerty. For the family and friends of Pastor Delwayne Hahn upon his death, and for Howard and Jan Preeb and family upon the death of Jan's brother, Glenn Foles. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. At this time, we are going to celebrate Holy Communion. For those of you who are worshiping at home, you can grab your elements, and I invite you to hold them in your hand as I speak the words of institution. We'll say the Lord's Prayer together, and then I'll instruct in consuming the elements. All right. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is the new promise in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now hear these words of promise as you receive the bread and wine. Receive the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. We give you thanks, almighty God, for this refreshing meal, the healing power, and the gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love for one another. In the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, we are going to sing our benediction.